June 2012. Alto University in Finland. The atmosphere is charged. As Linus Torvalds, the usually soft-spoken creator of the Linux operating system, faces a question about hardware support. With a wry smile, he unexpectedly raises his middle finger and declares, Fuck you, NVIDIA. The room erupts in shocked laughter and applause. This moment, an open-source pioneer bluntly calling out a tech giant encapsulates Torvald's fiery dedication to principle. NVIDIA, he explains, was the single worst company he dealt with regarding Linux support. It's an infamous flash of candor that would ricochet around the tech world. But to understand how Torvalds earned the stature to publicly chastise a corporate behemoth, we must journey back to his beginnings to see how an accidental revolutionary was born. Linus Benedict Torvalds was born on December 28, 1969 in Helsinki, Finland. He grew up in an academic family. The son of two journalists, Anna and Nils Torvalds, and the grandson of a renowned statistician, Leo Tankvist. His parents were 1960s campus radicals, fostering a spirit of independent thinking that Linus carried into his own work. As a boy, Linus was introverted and intensely curious. That curiosity found its focus at age 11 when his grandfather, a professor, introduced him to a modest home computer, the Commodore VIC-20. The VIC-20 sparked Linus's first love affair with code. He learned BASIC on this machine and, unsatisfied with surface-level programming, began poking at the computer's innards. Before long, young Linus was bypassing high-level languages and directly manipulating the machine's 6502 microprocessor in raw machine code. Without formal training, he taught himself how to make the hardware dance to his instructions. It was the beginning of a lifelong fascination with low-level computing, understanding systems from the ground up. Shortly thereafter, Linus acquired a Sinclair QL, a more advanced computer, and modded its software extensively. Software was scarce in Finland, so he simply wrote his own even creating an assembler and a Pac-Man-style game by himself. These solitary experiments were laying the groundwork for an extraordinary adventure. In 1988, Torvalds enrolled at the University of Helsinki as a computer science student. His studies were interrupted by Finland's mandatory military service, a detour that saw him serve as an army second lieutenant. But by 1990, he was back on campus, eager to dive into operating systems. That year, Linus encountered Unix for the first time on a university deck. Microvax computer running Ultrix. The elegance of Unix intrigued him. Soon after, he stumbled upon Minix, a tiny Unix-like system created for teaching by Professor Andrew Tannenbaum. Minix came with Tannenbaum's book Operating Systems, design and implementation which Linus read hungrily. It was as if a door had opened. Here was a blueprint of an operating system, a playground of ideas and source code. Linus's curiosity ignited into a mission. Not to build a commercial product, not to start a revolution, but simply to see if he could create a working OS of his own. Before we continue, a quick but important note, Rust has been rising fast. AWS, Microsoft and Google are all betting on it for systems where performance and safety really matter. Enter Let's Get Rusty, the sponsor of this video, the go-to place for Rust training. They focus entirely on Rust education and job placement, and they've helped thousands of developers learn and master the language. And here's the good news, a new cohort launches next month. Spots are limited. Visit letsgettrusty.com slash start with code stories or click the link in the pinned comment. And thanks to Let's Get Rusty for sponsoring this video. Now, back to the story. On January 5th, 1991, 21-year-old Linus bought a new Intel 386-based PC. The first computer he owned that was powerful enough to support serious coding. He installed Minix, but it wasn't quite what he wanted. So, in his modest Helsinki apartment, Linus began crafting his own kernel, the core engine of an operating system from scratch. It was a deeply personal project, driven by curiosity and the joy of creation. By late summer 1991, his embryonic OS could barely do much, but it ran. On August 25, 1991, Linus announced his work on an internet news group with a now legendary posting. Hello everybody out there using Minix I'm doing a free operating system. Just a hobby. Won't be big and professional like GNU for 386 AT clones. He emphasized it was just a hobby, nothing ambitious. Certainly not something that would rival operating systems from giants like Microsoft or even the GNU project. In hindsight, this humble disclaimer is almost ironic. At the time, however, it was genuine. Linus had no grand plan for world domination. He was a student having fun with code. Linus released the first Linux code version, point zero one, in September 1991 by uploading it to an FTP server at his university. Initially, he wanted to name his creation freaks, a blend of free, freak, and Unix reflecting its quirky, free-spirited nature. 
but a colleague administering the server felt the project should carry its author's name. Unbeknownst to Linus, the folder was labeled Linux. Short, simple, and now eponymous. The name stuck. As Linux slowly spread on the internet, early adopters began sending feedback and patches. Torvalds welcomed this collaboration. Here was an operating system emerging not from a corporate lab, but from a loose collective of volunteers, communicating over email and newsgroups. From the very start, Linux was shared freely source code open for anyone to tinker with. But in the beginning, Linus had a small restriction. He released Linux under a license that allowed free use and distribution, but disallowed any commercial profit. This was, after all, a student's hobby project. That changed in 1992 when Richard Stallman, the evangelist of the free software movement, entered the picture. Torvalds attended a talk by Stallman that championed software freedom and the GNU, general public license. Inspired and under gentle pressure from early contributors, Linus made a pivotal decision. He relicensed Linux under the GPL version 2 in 1992, fully embracing a model where anyone could use, modify, and sell the software. So long as the source remained open, this move was critical. It meant Linux wasn't just free in price, it was free in the sense of liberty. Anyone from a student to a corporation could build on Linux, a stark contrast to the closed, proprietary operating systems of the day, the community responded with enthusiasm. Throughout the early 1990, a growing ensemble of programmers around the world contributed code to Linux. They added device drivers, network capabilities, and endless improvements. Linus, working via email from his dorm room, became the benevolent coordinator reviewing contributions, folding the best of them into the official kernel. In 1993, barely two years after its inception, Linux had attracted enough support that multiple user-led distributions sprang up. By March 1994, Torvalds released Linux version 1.0, a milestone that cemented its stability and potential. That same year, the young Finnish student graduated with a master's degree. But his one-man hobby had already grown far bigger than any academic project. Not everyone was convinced in those early days. Some established computer scientists criticized Linux's architecture, notably Andrew Tannenbaum, the creator of Minix who infamously declared in 1992 that Linux is obsolete, arguing that its monolithic kernel design was inferior to modern microkernels. Torvalds fired back on the internet forums defending his creation. With sharp technical arguments and a bit of cheeky humor, the tenenbaum torvalds debate became tech law. It was an early sign of Linus's combativeness, a trait the world would see more of, but also of a fundamental belief that technical merit, proven through working code, wins out over theory. Indeed, as the years passed, Linux's real-world success spoke louder than any academic critique. By 1996, five years in, Linux was no longer an underground curiosity. It was a robust, Unix-like OS flourishing on university servers and hobbyists' PCs. That year, Linus Torvalds, then just 26, took a leap that symbolized Linux's growing up. He accepted a job in Silicon Valley. In early 1997, he moved to California to work for Transmeta, a tech startup where he could continue improving Linux on the side. The move from Helsinki to the heart of the tech world was itself a sign of the times. Open source software was becoming impossible to ignore. In 1998, a watershed moment came when major companies and the press began talking about open source as the next big thing. Corporate players started seeing Linux not as a curiosity but as an opportunity. A flurry of support followed. In 1999, two leading Linux distributors Red Hat and VA Linux went public on the stock market and each granted Torvald stock options in gratitude for his creation. Suddenly, the young programmer who had never sought to make money from Linux found himself holding shares worth millions of dollars. That year, Red Hat's and VA Linux's IPOs briefly made Linus worth an estimated $20 million on paper. Torvalds, characteristically, didn't let this change his focus. He was more amused than enticed by the windfall. But the message was clear. In the late 90s, Linux had arrived. It was no longer just a hacker's playground. It was a technology businesses were betting on. The ultimate validation came from one of the largest tech companies on Earth. In 2000, IBM announced it would invest $1 billion to support and develop Linux worldwide. By that year, IBM had 1,500 engineers working on Linux-related projects. The image of Big Blue pouring money and resources into an open-source OS, something essentially given away for free, was shocking to industry old-timers. But IBM had calculated that collaborating on a shared platform would benefit everyone and hurt their mutual rival, Microsoft. The gamble paid off. IBM and other companies improved Linux for enterprise use, contributing code for running on big mainframes and power servers. In effect, the community that Linus had nurtured now extended inside the walls of corporations. 
By the early 2000s, Linux was running web servers, powering financial networks, and taking its first steps into consumer devices. The open source revolution was in full swing, with Torvalds at its helm albeit. A helm he shared with thousands of co-developers. Through Linux's rise, Linus Torvalds remained something of an enigma. He was not a flashy CEO or a pontificating evangelist. He was a self-proclaimed engineer who just liked writing good code. In interviews, he came across as pragmatic, witty, and unapologetically honest. Open source is the only right way to do software, Torvalds often said, reflecting his core belief in collaborative development. Yet he balanced ideology with practicality. He also admitted he'd use the best tool for the job, even if that includes proprietary software when necessary. This pragmatism showed in 2002, when he chose to use a proprietary program, BitKeeper, to manage Linux's growing code base. Some in the community were dismayed, but Linus prioritized technical efficiency at the time. However, when that arrangement fell apart in 2005, Torvalds responded in the most open source way possible. He wrote a new tool himself. In just weeks, he created Git, a distributed version control system, as a free replacement for BitKeeper. Git would go on to become a cornerstone of software development used by millions of developers beyond Linux. It was a prime example of Linus's ethos. If the existing solutions aren't good or open enough, build a better one and share it. All of these traits were on full display that day in 2012, when Linus dropped the F-bomb on NVIDIA. And NVIDIA has been the single worst company we've ever dealt with. So NVIDIA, fuck you. <laughs> He was frustrated by what he saw as a company neglecting Linux users, and he gave voice and gesture to that frustration in the most direct way possible. The clip went viral, turning a niche technical complaint into a global headline. Many Linux users cheered his boldness. Finally, someone telling hardware makers to shape up. Others cringed at the crassness. Torvalds, for his part, didn't apologize. This was vintage Linus, unyielding in defense of open source users, no matter the proprieties. Yet even a rebel can reflect, a few years later, in 2018. Torvalds surprised the community by issuing a public apology for his past behavior. In the release notes for Linux 4.19, he acknowledged that his personal attacks were unprofessional and uncalled for, and he announced he'd take time off to learn to better understand people's emotions. Amidst the technical saga, Linus Torvalds' personal life remained grounded and low-key. In 1993, as a young instructor at the University of Helsinki, Linus ran a beginner's lab class. As legend has it, he asked students to send him an email as a systems test and one student, a computer science freshman named Tov Moni, boldly responded asking Linus out on a date. Linus accepted. Tov Moni was no ordinary student. She happened to be a six-time national karate champion of Finland. The pair hit it off and Tov became Linus's wife in 1997. Over the years, they've had three daughters together. Friends describe Torvalds as a devoted family man and a private individual. While he is outspoken online, in person he often prefers a quiet life. In 2012, Linus Torvalds was awarded the Millennium Technology Prize, sometimes called the Nobel Prize of Tech, honoring the significance of Linux on humanity. Today, the scope of Linus Torvalds' impact is almost impossible to overstate. The Linux kernel he first posted on the internet in 1991 has become the beating heart of a technological era. Linux runs on nearly 77% of all web servers worldwide, and on 100% of the top 500 supercomputers, those behemoths crunching scientific and financial data in research labs and stock exchanges. When you use an Android smartphone, you are effectively using Linus's creation. Android's operating system is built on the Linux kernel, and it powers about 72% of all smartphones on the planet. From smart TVs to routers, from the International Space Station to the New York Stock Exchange, Linux is everywhere. This vast ecosystem, collectively worth billions of dollars, grew from the free code of a college student who just wanted to have fun programming. It's a legacy built not by one man alone, but by a global community that Linus Torvalds nurtured and still leads.